So, uh, hi everyone, good to see everyone again. This is ECE5760, which is Advanced Microcontroller Design and System on a Chip. Um, a lot of you know me, but my name's Hunter, and I'm going to be one of two instructors for this course this semester. The other one, a lot of you also know, but is Bruce, uh, who's just chatting, but if Bruce, if you just want to say hi. I just I just turned off my video so I could eat lunch. Sorry. <laughs> so you're seeing me chewing. Uh, good morning. It's a, um, it's a fun course. So Bruce and I are going to be co-instructing this class this semester in basically the same way that we co-instructed 4760 last semester. So those of you that took microcontrollers last semester, the setup of this course is going to feel really familiar. But for those of you that uh, weren't in that course, I'll just sort of briefly go over what to expect structure wise. Um, so as far as the co instruction goes, the way that Bruce and I have been handling this is I'll conduct all the lectures and Bruce when he's able to and when he wants to will attend those lectures and is welcome to jump in at any time. And I'll occasionally turn to him to help answer questions and provide insights on various topics. Um, and then with regard to the labs, the the uh, the laboratory assignments. I'll be in all of your lab sections to help you debug. And Bruce, too, when he's available, will stop in to help you debug. So for those of you that don't already know us extremely well, you will get to know us extremely well. This is one of those classes where you really, really get to know the core staff because we end up spending lots of time in the lab together building and debugging stuff. Um, so for those of you I don't yet know, looking forward to getting to know you. My goal for today is to briefly summarize the structure and logistics of this course just so that folks know what to expect and then i want to talk at quite a high level about the hardware that we're going to be using um, as the title of the course suggests we're using this system on a chip called the de1 soc and there's a lot to talk about with this system but i want to just kind of introduce it and discuss some of the high level concepts associated with it and some of the ways that we'll be using it and the way i expect to spend most of the remaining time of today is talking through and demonstrating some of the stuff that you'll be building throughout this semester. Um, like, like 4760, the microcontrollers course, this is a very much a practical engineering class, by which I mean this is a class where you should expect to do most of your learning, probably 80 to 90 percent of your learning, in the laboratory in the process of building things. Um, so this class is, it might feel a little bit different than many of the other classes that you've taken, except for microcontrollers. For those of that have taken that, it's gonna feel pretty familiar. But it may feel different only in that this class, it, if you look at the syllabus for this class, you won't see a calendar with topics associated with particular dates throughout the semester, as you might expect to find in the syllabi for some of your other courses. And the reason for that is because this is a practical engineering course, instead of taking the approach of having sort of a, a list of topics that we'll step through, what we do instead is provide a set of objectives in the form of laboratory assignments. And the purpose of this whole class and the purpose of these lectures is to help you achieve those objectives. So in the process of doing that, we're going to cover a whole bunch of topics in this course. But the reason I can't provide something like a calendar of topics for a class like this is the lectures are in response to the labs. So these lectures exist entirely to support the lab exercises. So I have a set of topics to go over, and I, I have an order that I think will be the right order to go over those topics. But if uh, I'm planning to give a lecture on some topic and in spending time with you all in lab, it becomes clear that people already have a pretty good grasp on that topic, then we'll talk about something else. Or, you know, alternatively, if we've already gone over something and it becomes clear that folks might benefit from a little extra time spent discussing that topic in lecture, then we'll spend some extra time on that. Um, so you can expect for these lectures to be quite responsive to the labs. And you can help me out with that too in just communicating with me a lot in terms of what's making sense, what's not making sense, and you know, if there's a particular topic that you'd like to revisit, just tell me, and um, we'll we'll schedule a lecture to talk more about whatever we need to talk about. So, in terms of structure, uh, the course is set up almost identically to the microcontrollers course, which is to say, 
There's three laboratory assignments. Each of those laboratory assignments lasts three weeks. And then the course will culminate with a four to five week totally independent design project. Um, what else to say about this? Each laboratory assignment is going to have an associated lab report. Those lab reports are the only homework, so to speak, associated with this class. So this class has no homeworks other than the lab reports and no exams. Um, instead, we have these lab exercises. But because we have no homeworks and have no exams, those lab exercises are extensive. So there will be a weekly milestone associated with each lab exercise. So each week in the lab, you'll be asked to demo some set of milestones associated with that lab, just like in microcontrollers. Um, and then at the end of each lab, there will be a demo of the full system. And you're evaluated. You can read about how you're evaluated um, in terms of grading associated with those labs on the course website. Um, I won't necessarily spend time here talking about it, but if there are questions after you guys read through that stuff, I can go over it. Um, some things to mention about this, I suppose, are, are this is a four credit course. So the university says that a credit hour should represent about four to five hours of week uh, of work per week for that class. So for this class, four credits, it's 16 to 20 ish hours. Um, I, I'm only reminding you of this because that's more hours per week than we will spend in organized lab hours and in lecture. So you should expect to be working on these lab exercises outside of class time. Um, and fortunately, because this is a, a master's class, an MEng class, you'll all be given access to the 238 lab. So you'll be welcome to go into that lab and work on your lab exercises anytime that you would like, so long as it's not occupied by another class. And on Canvas, I'll put down the um, the schedule for that lab so that you know when you're safe to go in there and when you should, I think 2300 is the other class in there this semester. So when we should stay out to give them some breathing room. Um, and then the final design project, those of you that, again, those of you that have taken microcontrollers, this is pretty familiar. Um, you are free to build anything that you want that's within reason and that appropriately uses the hardware or the, the, the device that we're um, studying in this course. And you can go, I'd encourage you to start going through the course website and look at projects that folks have done in previous semesters to try to start kicking around ideas. Is. Um, you know, I know it's like day zero of, <laughs> of class, but it's a big project and you spend a lot of time working on it. So it's a good idea to start thinking about it early. Michael, did you have a question? Uh, yes. So I'm just wondering uh, for the homeworks and the uh, design project, does it have to be like in groups that's within the same uh, lab period or it could be cross period? That's a good question. So, so let, I'm going to give you a tentative answer and then I'll confirm that answer later. But my tentative answer is that if you want to work with folks that are in other lab sections, that's okay with me because the lab for this class is a little bit more flexible than it is for the microcontrollers class. All that I would ask in the case that you do that is that if you are in, say, the Monday lab and the person you're working with is in the Wednesday lab, please do your checkouts on whichever is the earliest in the week lab section. So in that case, you would check out on Monday. And um, I, it would also be great if everyone in that lab group could be there for the lab checkout. They wouldn't necessarily have to stay for the whole lab section. But if, if the lab group could be there for each lab checkout, that would be good. But okay. subject to those constraints, I'm okay with people working with folks outside of their lab section. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Other questions about that? Okay. Um, so then what I, what I want to discuss a little bit is the hardware that we'll be working with, um, which is pictured here on the screen. This is, like I said, it's the DE1 SOC, which is a board developed by Altera, although I think Altera has been subsequently subsumed by some other company. Um, but in any case, at the time it was developed, it was Altera. And what you're looking at is an image, uh, a labeled image of the board. And I'm just going to sort of walk through some of what's on here. We'll work with a lot of the stuff that's on this board, not everything, though, obviously, for your final projects, you're free to use 
whatever you want on this thing. Um, but the big device here in the middle is uh, sort of the, the target board. And so this is the uh, a device that contains a Cyclone 5 FPGA and an internal ARM Cortex-A9. So this is what makes this device a system on a chip is it contains an FPGA and it contains an ARM. So in each of our lab exercises, you will be writing C code, which will run on the ARM, and you'll be writing Verilog, which runs on the FPGA, and you'll be getting the two to talk to one another through a system that I'm going to talk about. Um, ultimately, it ends up looking like memory mapping, like pointing the Verilog and the C code to the same memory so that the two can talk to one another. Um, exactly how that works from the FPGA side and from the ARM side looks a little bit different. We'll, we'll discuss the details of that. But every lab will involve a few different levels of abstraction. There will be the C level of abstraction, the Verilog level of abstraction, and then the merging of the two to get the two to talk to one another. And that kind of hints at what I would say is sort of the, the whole point of this course where, how to put this? So, so when folks ask for me to summarize the microcontrollers course in like a sentence, the way that I like to summarize that course is that it's about hardware software co-design. So it's about designing systems that use hardware where hardware is appropriate and software where software is appropriate. If I had to summarize this class in like a sentence, what I would say is that it's about hardware acceleration via FPGAs. And what I mean by that is what each of the labs in this course will focus on is taking some algorithm, and it's going to be a different algorithm for each lab exercise, but we'll take some algorithm and we'll get that algorithm to run as quickly as we can on a conventional processor, in this case, the ARM. Right, so in lab two, for example, we are simulating the 2D wave equation on the surface of a membrane to simulate a drum strike. I'll demo this. It, the challenge in that lab, incidentally, is to simulate as big of a drum as you can. Bigger drum, more computation, right? And in lab three, we're going to be calculating and rendering the Mandelbrot set, which is uh, the most awesome mathematical structure that exists. And we'll spend a lot of time talking about just how cool it is. But in any case, it, for both of these labs, what we'll do is start on just the arm and see how big of a drum can you simulate on the arm and how quickly can you calculate and render the Mandelbrot set just on the arm. And then the whole exercise will be how much can you speed up the calculation of that algorithm by offloading aspects of it to the FPGA by building, by building application specific hardware on the FPGA that parallelizes the calculation of that algorithm in some, in some aspect. Um, and this, what, what you'll find is that the speed ups that you get are dramatic. Um, we'll talk about the details of that. The, the metrics by which we evaluate your performance increase will vary from lab to lab. In lab two, the metric by which we evaluate your performance increase will be how many nodes of a drum can you simulate at audio rate. In lab three, it will be how fast can you calculate and render the Mandelbrot set on a 640 by 480 screen. Um, that involves, I forget how many calculations. I figured this out before lecture and now I've forgotten. It's a lot. Um, it would be it, on just the arm, it takes something like, I think the fastest I've been able to get it to render on the arm is around three seconds. And the fastest that I saw a group calculate and render it using the FPGA last semester was, I think, like 35 milliseconds. So it's wicked fast. And for both of these labs and for all of the labs, there will be a fun user interface aspect to it. So in the case of the Mandelbrot set, you will be able to zoom in and pan around on this fractal pattern, um, which is just interesting. And in the case of the drum, you'll be able to play with things like the size of the drum, which will generate different pitches and um, some of the parameters in the 2D wave equation that will produce slightly different audio effects, um, specifically as we'll talk about a nonlinear pitch glide. The, the percussion musicians among you may know that when you strike a drum, there's a slight drop in pitch. It goes boo. And we're going to be adding that nonlinear effect to the equation that we're integrating so that the, the drum that we synthesize will also have that effect. In any case, we're, we're going to talk in more detail about those labs, but that's just kind of a uh, 
preview. Um, some of the other stuff that's on this device, though, in addition to the, the, the central processor that we'll be working with, there's, um, and what you can see, incidentally, is according to this code up here, it's showing you which of these peripheral devices are attached to the FPGA and which are attached to the arm. So on the FPGA side, you have a bunch of button, four buttons and a whole bunch of switches and a seven segment LED display. You're going to find these incredibly useful for debugging, um, among other things, but you'll interact with those quite a lot. There's an ADC which communicates with the FPGA. We won't be using that ADC in any of our lab exercises this semester, but in the past groups have found that useful for final projects. Um, there's an audio codec. So this is a separate, uh, a separate audio device that's actually communicated with over an I2C interface that's largely abstracted away from you. But we'll use it, we will be using this in lab two to do the drum synthesis. Um, there's a microphone input and a couple of line outputs. So you can talk to the FPGA and the FPGA can talk back to you. This could be interesting for things like speech vocoders, um, any kind of uh, audio processing projects that could be really interesting. There's a video in. So we have some video cameras in the lab that will interface with the FPGA that would allow for you to do things like um, real time processing on the bit string coming out of the video camera. So in the past, folks have done things like um, real time color averaging that allows for you to point the video camera at, say, someone's face and the image that gets in real time rendered on the VGA display looks an awful lot like a comic book drawing or something, a sort of flattened color image of the person's face. So you can do all kinds of really interesting real-time video processing through this video input. Um, there's a VGA output. We'll be using that in lab one and in lab three. And you may find it useful also in lab two for debugging that we won't, it's not sort of a core element of the lab. Um, there's an ethernet connection to the arm. Um, I'll just mention very briefly that the way that you interact with this ARM device is there's an SD card slot here, and you'll be given a micro SD card and asked to put a, um, a specific Linux image on it, and we'll boot Linux onto the ARM side of the system on a chip. And you'll be asked to do some network configuration, but ultimately you'll SSH into the ARM side and interact with that via a Linux terminal which has a GCC compiler. So, you know, you, the workflow will be something like write C code on a lab PC or on your own PC, copy it over to the ARM, compile it there and run it there. But ultimately you're interacting with the ARM through a, a Linux terminal and accessing it through an SSH connection. Um, there's a bunch of GPIO output. You, you may also find these useful for debugging. You can put a jumper cable on one of those GPIO output ports and put data to the scope. It's incredibly, it's a really nice way to debug these systems. As many of you are aware, and as those of you that have not worked much with FPGAs in the past will learn, debugging these things is quite different from debugging a more conventional processor. It requires uh, a little bit, I don't know what word to use. It's just different. So things like using the oscilloscope will be very useful. The buttons and switches will be very useful. Um, most useful of all, I would say, in terms of debugging the FPGA will be the simulation environment. Um, you will start every one of these labs by simulating the core logic. The, the, whatever logic you're implementing in Verilog, you will start by implementing that logic in a simulation environment and debugging it to the furthest possible extent that you can there before transferring it over to the hardware. And the reason for that is Verilog, as you're all aware, is a hardware description language. So when you write Verilog, you're describing a circuit. And when you compile that Verilog, it is that compilation process involves placing, placing that circuit within the logic available on the FPGA, which can take a long time, right? So particularly for these labs where we're gonna be pushing the FPGA to its limit by using a whole lot of the resources that are available on it, that compilation process can take 20 minutes to an hour. So you have to be very, uh, 
Time is a resource that you need to optimize in this class. Let me put it that way. And a good way to optimize that resource is to spend as much time as you can in the Verilog simulation environment. Prove to yourself that the Verilog works in the simulation environment and then implement it on the FPGA. And the lab exercises are written to encourage you to use that workflow. We'll spend some time in lecture discussing that simulation environment. Um, anything else to mention on here? There's an accelerometer, which is kind of weird. I've not seen anyone use that accelerometer. Maybe you'll find a use for it. I'm not sure. Um, there's a, a infrared output and an infrared input. Maybe someone wants to make, I don't know, some sort of super over the top television remote or something. I'm not sure. But in any case, that's available for you to use. Um, this is pictured here is a more schematic image of a lot of all of the same peripherals, but represented schematically and showing you which side of the system on a chip the device is attached to, the FPGA side or the ARM side. I'll mention incidentally that in the documentation, in Altera's documentation, they refer to the ARM side of the system on a chip as the HPS, which I believe stands for hard processor system. So anywhere in the documentation that you see HPS, they're referring to the ARM side of the system on a chip. So uh, what you can see here is just all of the peripherals that I just talked through, just showing you which side that it's connected to. Any questions about this stuff? There are a lot of peripherals where, uh, you know, very obviously we're not going to be using all of them in every lab and they'll be introduced one at a time, but I just want to introduce the whole system so that you have a sense of the sort of device that we're going to be working with. I have one question. Okay, yeah. So, sorry. So you just said the HPS is like the microcontroller side and then the FPGA is the FPGA. So is there a way we could pass waveforms or data direct? Well, I guess we'll learn how to do this, but like passing waveforms, say, from maybe a USB host or ethernet straight to FPGA for timing or different things? Bruce, do you wanna answer that? So USB protocol is kind of painful to put in hardware. And I have seen people use the ARM side to handle the USB, decode that to say an image or a sound stream and then pass that as digital data across the uh, bus link to the FPGA side. So you can get, if you, well, if you go Ethernet to, to, um, to FPGA through the arm, you can certainly get um, hundreds of kilobytes a second, probably megabytes a second. I haven't, I'm not too sure on that because in all the cases I tested, my rate limiting step was the PC on the other end of the ethernet. The communication is often a bottleneck though. I'll just getting the data into and out of the FPGA can often be the bottleneck in the whole process. Um, but actually Akube, that's a good segue into the next thing I wanted to just briefly mention, which is the mechanism by which this communication between the ARM and the FPGA actually takes place. And I, I want to just introduce this. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about this, but I'm trying to represent this somewhat schematically. So on one side of this picture, you have the ARM, which is programmed in C. We compile that C using a GCC compiler that's, that's on the ARM. And then on the other side is the FPGA, which will program in Verilog. And I'm indicating here that that simulation environment, incidentally called model sim, this is the side that we're simulating in that simulation environment. But the way that this communication works is the ARM communicates with its L3 cache. It, it's this heinously complicated bus system. The ARM communicates to the L3 cache, the Axi bus, over to this, this proprietary Avalon bus and ultimately into the FPGA and vice versa. The point that I want to make here is this complicated bus structure is mostly abstracted away from the developer for this system. So from the ARM direction, looking at the FPGA, communicating with the FPGA from the ARM looks like memory mapping. So what it looks like is pointing to a specific memory address and 
the ARM can put data at that address. And as long as we configure the FPGA properly via mechanisms that I'll describe, it can see the data that goes there. And you can use that data in your, in your Verilog. And then from the other direction, there's this graphical programming interface that I'll show you called QSYS that makes adding things to this bus look to the user like dragging and dropping elements onto this graphical interface and clicking to enable connections among systems on this bus. Um, and it also allows for you to expose aspects of that bus into your Verilog to do computation on. So we'll look at this in a lot of detail, but the point that I'm making is that this complicated bus system from the ARM side looks like memory mapping. And from the FPGA side to talk to the ARM, we're gonna use this graphical programming interface called QSYS and some will expose some aspects of this QSYS to Verilog and do some stuff and make some of those connections in Verilog as well. To talk a little more about the speed, it could be it's, um, it's possible to get 400 megabytes a second across this bus link between the ARM and the FPGA, but more likely you'd be at around 70 to 80 megabytes a second, which is pretty good. Vlad, that's, that's really fast. Question, Michael? Oh, uh, yeah. So, like, when we're talking about this, I'm assuming that once we have a really fast clock, the timing is going to be a little bit weird to control if we have a really big design. So I'm just wondering, are we like using, uh, do we have to self-design this interface or it's gonna be like a uh, pre-designed something that we could use from the library? This interface that's, that I'm describing right now? Oh, uh, yes. This, the, the uh, you don't have to build the interface, but you have to configure the interface, if that makes sense. So, so in terms of, um, setting up the infrastructure to make this communication happen that is built already by the company that developed this board but what we as the developers have to do is configure it for our specific application so that's where that's where that's the work that you will have to do in terms of getting these two systems to talk to one another All right so like uh, i think um, my question is more like do we have we do we only need to provide the package or we have to uh, provide the signal that uh like uh announces the packages to the, the three buses as well. You will need to, if I understand your question properly, I think it's one kind of related to synchronization between the ARM and the FPGA. How oh, does yes. one know when the other has sent? You are responsible for those sorts of signals. So there, there's two levels. The low level uh, uh, synchronization on the bus uh, is handled in the way you would expect with a cache cache waits until it gets a response on the fpga side data appears when it's valid or there's a valid signal that comes along with the data but higher level abstraction of synchronization like frames in an animation you do yourself right uh so then my, my there's a second question then uh uh, once we have a, like a real large design, right? And, and when the algorithms run into place of our designs on the FPGA, it's possible that like the signal that we want to try, like like the activation and like those sorts of synchronizing uh, signals is going to be uh, uh, not working. Do, do, do you understand what I mean? So I'm just wondering, is it possible to probe those signals? Because in smaller sim, we will see it working, right? Like, is it possible to probe it in this board or? So what you're asking is, if it passes model sim, will it pass timing? Yeah, because I know that in some other board, like there's a digital interface built into real time monitor, like what exactly is happening at the panel. There is, there is a, there is a software to analyze whether your timing is valid or not. However, I've seen very weird timing errors that are not caught by any analysis stuff. Right, because like, for example, in, in the Xilinx board, you can real time see what's happening on the pings, but I don't think the Altera D1 SOC has this ability. So one option, there is, I will say, um, 
there's an on-chip logic analyzer that you can add to the board. So you can incorporate it into your design called signal tap. You'll be asked to do this as a part of your lab one so that you get familiar with it. So you can put a logic analyzer on there that allows for you to look at these signals at full bus rate. But you are actually putting that logic analyzer onto the FPGA. So it consumes memory and logic. Right. So as your design starts to grow, it may be the case that you can no longer fit the logic analyzer onto the board with your design. But you can you, you can use this logic analyzer to analyze the system when it's more compact. Right. And in the past, like I've had experience just like put that signal onto a specific pin and that's probable. So I'm just kind of asking like, does the lab has these types of equipment or? You, you, can, you can certainly put a signal out to a GPIO pin and probe it. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, that is, that, okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Another question? Uh, it's kind of related to Michael's question, but uh, uh, I was just confirming like uh, when you're, when, when, when uh, uh, Professor Bruce saying like, uh, when you're trying to uh, use a valid or some like, like uh, explicit signals to indicate uh, timing or indicate like uh, when arm is ready. So does that mean that we have to kind of extract axi bus out uh, into like directly into our board or like separate axis signals out instead of using like QSIS or like the memory mapping is providing. I'm not sure if I fully understand the question. You, you, you will not need to, what am I trying? You will not need to dissect the axi bus if that's what you're asking. You'll be working at the level of QSIS. Yeah. Oh, okay. So not, not to the lower level of axi bus. You can do that if you're feeling really masochistic. <laughs> but but you don't have to. Okay. Yeah, I'll just kind of like, maybe I'll, I'll ask it later during like actual lab hours, but I'm just kind of confused about how QSIS work with axi bus, like signals for indication of, you know, ready or valid. Sure, that I, I totally believe that. I hope that it'll become a little clearer as we start talking about that stuff in more detail. Um, but just kind of introducing it at this point. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions before I just quickly show you what each lab exercise is going to be? Okay, then let me, so the first lab exercise, let me see here um is I'm gonna move zoom around so um i have a remote desktop connection open to a lab piece well it's open to a pc next to me but it's configured like a lab pc which reminds me incidentally these first two weeks are fully remote fortunately the first lab checkout for lab one is a simulation based lab checkout so lab one as i'm about to demonstrate is um, we are asking you to implement an ODE solver in Verilog. And what you'll be asked to do for the week one checkout is demonstrate that that integrator is working in the simulation environment. So each of you have been given remote desktop access to the lab PCs in Philips 238, which have the simulation software installed on them. It's free, by the way. If you want to download this software to your own laptop, you're welcome to, but you can also access the lab PCs that have them installed via remote desktop. Um, so in, the, in this week's lab, uh, in lab this week, so today for the Monday people and then Wednesday and Friday, all that I'm going to ask for folks to do is remote desktop into those lab PCs so that we confirm everyone can do it. Sometimes it takes just a little bit of troubleshooting to get that to work, but you'll be able to remote desktop into the lab PCs and do the week one checkout for lab one remotely. Um, and then by the time we get to the hardware, we, sh we will, fingers crossed, be back in person. <laughs> so, so it won't be an issue. Um, it, but, and if, if plans change, then we have contingency plans and um, we'll set that stuff up, but I'm optimistic. Okay, in any case, lab one, you'll be asked to integrate an ODE solver and visualize it on the VGA display. The particular ODEs that you'll be integrating 
let me see here. I'm going to pull up. I have a camera. This is just showing. This is the DE1 and a VGA display. People know what kind of bird that is, incidentally? Osprey. Walk, walk up by BB Lake. You'll see them. They're awesome. In any case, so there's the device that's hooked up to the VGA display. And if I rotate this, there's another camera that's pointed directly at the screen. And what you'll be asked to do is make a, let me just run. So there's Verilog installed that, that I have programmed on the FPGA. And then via a command line, a Linux command line interface to the ARM, I'm going to run some C code that allows for me to start the system. And what you're seeing on the screen, hopefully, if it's visible, is um, this particular set of ODEs being integrated. And I can speed up the integration. Do people recognize these curves? These are my, this is my favorite set of couple differential equations. Um, so you probably, it's, it's a, it, what it's doing is the, the curve that it is uh, integrating is a 3D curve. And we're looking at th the three projections of that curve. So in the upper left, you're seeing the XZ projection, upper right is the YZ projection, and in the bottom is the XY projection. This is the Lorenz system. And if you've ever heard the phrase, the butterfly effect, it comes from the curve in the upper left, which is the butterfly curve. And what I'm doing is integrating these equations and then through this user interface that I've built, I can do things like clear the screen and have it keep drawing. I can pause integration. I can play integration. I can make integration happen really fast or I can slow it way down. Slow, 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 slower down. Um, and then the other thing that I can do, which I won't demonstrate in real time, because I think it would take a little bit of time for me to punch in numbers is in real time, this interface allows for you to change the parameters of this set of equations. So there are three parameters that describe the evolution of this system. Well, there's the initial conditions for the state variables, X, Y, and Z. And then there's parameters, Sigma, beta, and rho, which appear in the differential equations. And depending on what values you assign to those parameters, the curves will look different. And through this interface, you'll be able to change those parameter values and see what the curve looks like, how it changes. The default parameter values are the ones that produce the most famous and recognizable set of curves. But the interface that you build will allow for you to play with this and see what it looks like with different sets of parameters. And I'll mention too, that you'll find some parameter settings that are super boring that just really quickly converge to a single point that just looks like a dot. And then you'll find others that produce variations on this theme of sort of a butterfly shaped curve. Some will be skinnier and it'll look, you know, interesting. So that's lab one. People have questions about that? I'll, I'll mention, by the way, that um, I, I mentioned earlier that the point of this class is hardware acceleration. And in each of these labs, what we're asking for you to do is use the FPGA to accelerate the calculation of some algorithm. That is not entirely true for lab one. Um, in lab one, we're, we're really not pushing the FPGA to its limit at all. What we're asking you to do instead is get familiar with this rather complicated system and get the arm to talk to the FPGA and the FPGA to talk back. And this is a fun way to figure out how all this stuff talks to one another so that in lab two, you're equipped to try to push things a little harder, try to push the FPGA a little harder. So let me attempt, and this is a real time demo, so it never exactly work, but let me attempt now to program the FPGA with the lab two code. Lab two, as I mentioned, is a, a drum synthesis lab. And I've joined this Zoom call from the lab PC that has the FPGA attached. And I have the mic, I have the audio codec output going through an audio jack to the microphone input of that lab PC. So if I unmute it, we should be able, fingers crossed, to hear the sounds that it produces. So let's see. Um, if I run this code, I didn't hear anything. Did you all? 
now let me see here one second Well, I'm not going to waste time debugging that. If it were working, what you would hear is a drum going bong, which is maybe a little bit of an anticlimax anyway. But in any case, the, the idea will be um, that you will program the FPGA to integrate the 2D wave equation in hardware, and you will be challenged to simulate the largest drum that you can at audio rate. What I mean by that is to synthesize audio, you're going to need to send a new voltage to the DAC at a very precise rate. In our case, it's going to be, um, oops, Siri heard me, oh, hold on. <laughs> uh, in our case, it's going to be 48 kilohertz. So 48,000 times a second, you need to send the DAC a new voltage that will be sent to the speaker. What that means is that every, you know, 48,000 times a second, you need to simulate the entire surface of the drum updating. The bigger the surface of that drum is, the more computation that evolves. So the group that simulates the largest drum will be the group that uses the hardware available on the FPGA most exhaustively, which is to say they don't, they don't not use anything. They use all the logic that they could possibly use and that uses that hardware the most wisely, which is to say their state machine that updates the drum does so in the least possible number of clock cycles. People that use the drum most, or that use the FPGA most exhaustively and most wisely will synthesize the biggest drum. The biggest drum last semester, or last year rather, was something like, I think it was like 80,000 nodes, which is just kind of mind blowing. Um, so you may be able to get more nodes than that, but that group, that group exhausted the FPGA. Um, so I think that's about the upper limit, but part of your lab report, because I'll be interested to learn this for each group is you'll be asked to report. What was your limiting resource? Did you run out of memory? Did you run out of logic? Did you run out of hardware multipliers? What did you run out of? Because for different strategies, different groups will run out of different resources first. And it'll be interesting to learn which, which resource you run out of. Okay. Let me, um, quickly program up lab three here. Need to move that. Lab three, just this one. By the way, the uh, software IDE that we use to program these devices is Cordis, which I think many of you are familiar with from uh, 2300. Okay. So let me get the camera up. So as I mentioned, lab three is going to be calculation and rendering of the Mandelbrot set, which is pictured here. Perhaps some of you, when I said Mandelbrot set, didn't, had never heard that, but maybe you recognize this image. The, the image is quite famous. Um, so this is sort of the poster child for fractals. It's a very famous mathematical structure. And what you can see here is through a mouse interface, I am able to pan this thing around and most interestingly, by clicking the mouse, I can zoom in. So let's zoom in. There's some regions of this fractal that have come to be quite famous. One example is the region I'm zooming into now, which is called Seahorse Valley, which has that name because these kind of look like upside down seahorses if you squint your eyes, low pass filter with your eyelashes. And you'll be able to zoom into this thing to a zoom level of about two to the 15. And one of the interesting features of the Mandelbrot set is its edge is infinitely complex and non-repeating, which means you can zoom in, you could zoom in in principle forever and you would keep finding new structure. And you will have the opportunity, two to the fifth, a zoom level of two to the 15 allows for you to truly explore. So you can explore the edges of this pattern and the exact colorization scheme that you choose will be up to you. I have a, a recommended colorization scheme based on this one that I think looks nice, but you might find one that you enjoy more. By the way, how, how much is a two to the 15 zoom level? 
at 2 to the 15, if we zoom all the way back out to this, so this Mandelbrot set is right now, you know, the width of the VGA display. When zoomed in at 2 to the 15, so let me go in 2 to the 15, that full Mandelbrot set would be 11 kilometers across. So zooming in, zooming in. So at this level, that Mandelbrot set that had composed the whole screen has now exploded to about, about 11 kilometers. About because that's based on me using a ruler to just measure the width of the VGA display. So it's quite fun. This is an example of a lab that people tend to um, have, a, have a lot of fun playing with once they've built it. Any questions about this? Okay, so then in the last few minutes, I'll just clarify the logistics for this first week. So we will have lab today for the people that are enrolled in the Monday sections. Um, the way that that'll work is the way that we did it for 4760 last year and this class the year last year also, which is um, there will be a Zoom call that you will log into. I'll wait for everyone to arrive and then I'll put people into various breakout rooms so that they can work on the labs in their breakout rooms. Um, for today, I will likely, well, maybe I'll allow people to just pick their own breakout rooms for today. Um, I'll ask for you to submit your group preferences at some point this week so that in the coming week, when we start the week one checkout for lab one, the groups will be organized. Um, and once you're in those breakout rooms, I'll be moving among those rooms to, um, to you know, see how things are going and help folks debug anything that needs debugging. I'll mention too that for the moment, we don't have a TA for this class. I'm working on finding one, but we do not have a TA for this class right now. Um, each of the lab sections has few enough groups that uh, it's not like microcontrollers, you know, where there's a huge amount of groups in each lab. So I'll be able to move around and see everyone quite frequently, but I'm just making you aware of that. I'm working on getting a TA. I don't have one right now. One of the consequences of a class like this, which is one that people generally take in their last semester here at Cornell is nobody's here that ever took this class. <laughs> so it's hard to find someone who's willing to TA a class they've never taken. Um, and it's also a class that's tricky to get a PhD student to TA because it requires a lot of their bandwidth. But in any case, I'm working on finding one. And in the meantime, just be maybe slightly patient with me if it takes me a couple extra minutes to get to your breakout room. Um, what, what was the conclusion on somebody taking the course and TAing it at the same time? It is allowed. Uh, all that I would ask is that they take the course as an independent study instead of being enrolled in this course per se but it would involve the same work. They would just be graded entirely separately. So incidentally, if anyone in this class wants to TA the class, <laughs> it's a weird thing to ask on the first day of class, uh, but reach out to me and maybe we could talk about it. Okay, uh, let me see here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, that's all I have for this afternoon. I'll stick around on the Zoom call for a few minutes in case anyone has anything that they want to talk about, but otherwise I'll see the Monday people in a little bit and I'll see everyone else on uh, Wednesday. If any questions come up in the meantime, just shoot me an email or let me know somehow.